first of all, to the College Winter Learning Seminar participants, um, my belated welcome to Yeshiva Hajar. And I'm sorry that I am not spending this week with you, but I hope that for an enormous majority of you, this will not be the last time you spend time at Kon Hadar, and that there will be ample opportunities to learn and talk and think together um, in the future. So, belatedly welcome. Um, and to the Sharfman family and to friends of the Sharfman family, um, I first of all want to thank you for honoring Eddie's memory, for choosing to do that here, and to say that I hope that the learning with you tonight um, is a fitting tribute to who he was and what he cared about. So thank you. What I'd like to try and do together tonight is to really explore a text and a worldview together. Um, a text um, by someone who is perhaps one could be surprised at encountering a figure like this at a place like this, and yet I think there's actually something um, profoundly um, relevant and powerful about learning Rav Dessler um, at the Kohen Hadar. And what I'm going to try to do tonight, first I'm going to say just a very few sentences about who Rav Eliyahu Dessler was. Then we're going to try to walk through um, probably his most famous essay, one of his two most famous essays, let's say. We're going to walk through his most famous essay, and we're going to try to talk a little bit, thank you very much, we're going to talk a little bit about the ideas that it raises, and also use it to open up some other kind of important foundational theological and spiritual questions. Um, so first, just a few sentences about Rav Dessler. First of all, his dates are 1892 to 1953. And he is one of the giants of the Musser movement in the 20th century. Um, he is a person who has enormous in the world of Musar, in the world of um, Jewish, the world of East European Jews who are particularly preoccupied with personal growth and ethical improvement. He is a student from a young age at the Musar Yeshiva in Kelm, which is one of the most illustrious Musar Yeshiva, where he is, this is really a little bit, you know, of insider baseball for a second, um, where he is a student of Tzvi Hirsch Browdy, who is the son-in-law of Reb Simcha Zissel Ziv, who is one of the central theorists of the Musar movement. Okay? I hope you wrote all that down. He receives smicha from his uncle, Reb Chaim Ozer Korzynski, who was one of the central, most influential figures in the Lithuanian yeshiva world, and who gave smicha very rarely and very reluctantly. At first, Rav Dessler is very committed to not earning money from his learning, and so goes into the family business, until in the late 1920s, he is forced to move from Eastern Europe to London, where his father needs medical care. And for reasons that are somewhat opaque, he ends up deciding to stay there and becomes a shul rabbi. Um, first, he's the rabbi of a synagogue in the East End, and then in a neighborhood called Dalston. Um, in the early 1940s, he becomes one of the founders of the Gateshead Kolel, the most prestigious place of higher Torah learning in England. And he stays there for almost a decade until the Rosh Yeshiva, the leader of the Panovich Yeshiva, one of the most illustrious misnagdic yeshivot in Eastern Europe, asks him to move to Israel and become the Mashkiach Rukhani, become the kind of spiritual supervisor of students, the spiritual mentor for the students. So he moves to the Panovich Yeshiva in B'nai Brak, where he lives for the rest of his life, um, and dies rather abruptly six years later um, of a heart attack. After his death, a couple of his students collect various things that he wrote, as well as their notes from various shiurim that he gave, and that becomes what's called Mikhtav Me'eliyahu, literally a letter from Eliyahu, which is an allusion to um, an important passage about Eliyahu Hanavi. Um, in English, a kind of truncated translation is published um, as Strive for Truth. The passage in Rav Dessler that we are going to read is called Kutras HaChesed, the pamphlet on loving kindness, we'll call it. And it's really the place in Rav Dessler's writing, I think, where we hear him lay out in characteristically straightforward, unadorned language what he thinks it means to be 
a religious person, a spiritually awake person, and an ethically sensitive person. Now, if we were to have this conversation on the Upper West Side in the 21st century, many of us would want to spend a lot of time disentangling and figuring out what the relationship between those three categories are. Rav Dessler thought that those categories were more or less overlapping. Um, and so, you know, we're going to sort of stipulate that, and if it's appropriate later, we can talk about it. But this is where he sort of lays out, what does a good life look like? And his answer is very simple. And here, this is really the one thing I want to say, you know, quite personally. His answer is so simple that I have to say that when I first learned this essay of his, I thought it was so simple as to be sort of shallow and simplistic. And the more I read this essay, and the more I've thought about it over the years, the more I think that the simplicity is, you know, a mask for incredibly nuanced and interesting um, ideas. And Rav Dessler, in certain ways, has suffered for his unwillingness to talk in the language of, I'll say this sort of in a gingerly way, he is not interested in showing off how many Rishonim and Achronim and rabbinic texts he's read. He's actually interested in talking very directly to people about what he imagines it means to live well. Um, that has enabled, as you might imagine, certain parts of the yeshiva, and they're like, oh, that's, that's cute. It's not cute. And, um, you learn more about the poslim than about the pasul in that, in that sentence. You learn more about those who attack him than about him. So we're going to try to open up this text um, and see what it does for us. Now, I spent a good part of today sort of anxious about should we do this text in Hebrew or in English? Um, and I think I'm going to start by doing it in English because I imagine that almost everyone in this room will be able to understand that, even though it violates... Um, some of my great principles. I also decided, because this essay is long, not to give everyone in the room both Hebrew and English because um, the earth is also a gift. Um, and it's just very long. So I hope you'll be able to follow however we do it. Okay? Um, so he begins, we're not going to read all of this, don't worry. And, and I'm going to sort of narrate a little bit. Okay? He begins by saying, when the Almighty created human beings, he made them capable of both giving and taking. These are the fundamental terms in Rav Dessler's worldview, no tain the no tell, a giver and a taker. The faculty of giving is a sublime power. It is one of the attributes of the blessed creator of all things. He is the giver par excellence. His mercy, his bounty, and his goodness extend to all his creatures. His giving is pure giving, for he takes nothing in return. He can take nothing, for he lacks nothing. As the verse says, <coughs> If you are righteous, what do you give to him? Here, Rev. Dessler, interestingly, I just want to sort of point out something interesting, right? Wants to use the notion that God is absolutely perfect. He is kind of importing a philosophical idea in order to make an ethical point, right? The philosophical idea that God is absolutely perfect and has no needs enables him to say not that God is removed and doesn't care, but rather that God's generosity must be utter generosity. Because after all, God couldn't need anything in return. This is, I don't mean to say that he doesn't believe it, but this is sort of metaphysics with a very clear ethical consequence he has in mind, which is to set up a paradigm of God as pure giver. Absolute graciousness, pure giving. Okay? Um, and then he's going to make a very stark claim. And before we get to it, I want to back up for a moment and sort of lead us into it. You know, a variety of Jewish thinkers in the history of Jewish thought have wrestled with the question, should I identify one aspect of the human being that is Tzalem Elohim? Right? So probably most famously to many people in this room, the Rambam famously argues that what is Tzalem Elohim? Reason. Sfornu, another you know, famous biblical commentary, says it is his capacity for freedom. The human being has a capacity to make decisions about his or her life. And we could kind of map out a list of people who answer the question, what is Tzalem Elohim? Now, here, I, I, this is now me interjecting for a second. I personally, in my own sort of thinking about these questions, have come to be 
very deeply opposed to this project of trying to identify what Salam Elohim is, and for two reasons. Number one, I think it's totally false to how Tanakh and Chazal think about Salam Elohim, which is a really good reason, which I'll talk about in a second. But number two, philosophically, when you set out to identify the, what I'm calling the dignity-conferring characteristic of a human being, you will always end up rendering some humans less than human. Right? If you say with the Rambam that a certain capacity for reason is Tzalem Elohim, you have the danger, Lahavdil, of ending up in the world of Peter Singer. Right? That is, some people have such limited mental capacities that they on some level cannot make the claim of having the dignity shared by all humans. And you can do this, by the way, obviously, I don't think the Rambam thought this. I just think in our day and age when we're actually aware of the sort of assault on human dignity from various fronts, that it's worth really thinking about the dangers of saying, oh, this is Tzalem Elohim. Right? That is Tzalem Elohim. Now, conveniently enough for this argument, it's also very clear that for the sages, for Chazal, for the Talmudic sages, Tzalem Elohim does not refer to this aspect or that of human life. It is the human being in her totality. Right? And in fact, I think if you read rabbinic sources carefully, as Israeli scholar Yir Lorberbaum has pointed out, I think like quite convincingly, it is the embodied human being who is Tzalem Elohim. It's not some abstract, disembodied, you know, spirit. It's actually the flesh and blood human. That, by the way, leads all kinds of scholars or rabbinic thought to ask the question, does that imply that Chazal think that God has some kind of physical appearance? And that's a discussion for another week-long seminar and discussion. But what I want to just point out is to keep in mind that there's a lot at stake in trying to answer what is Tzalem Elohim. The positive thing is you will learn from a thinker what he or she imagines is the most important divine-like aspect of a human being. But you also are on, I would say, potentially, say this carefully, potentially treacherous moral ground. Now, Rav Dessler does decide to participate in this conversation of what is Tzalem Elohim, but he gives a really interesting answer that is, um, consciously or not, a repudiation of a lot of what comes before. He says, what is Tzalem Elohim? Tzalem Elohim is being born with the capacity to give. Just as God is the model of giving generously, human beings all have the capacity I want to sort of underline that carefully. We all have the capacity. We do not always develop or nurture that. And in some ways, we may shrink or actively work to undermine it. But we all have the capacity that can be lessened, but never fully destroyed, he claims. Right? We all have the capacity to give. And that is Tzalem Elohim. So if you look at the next line, actually, I skipped a line. Or skip one paragraph, for, okay? Man has been granted the sublime power of giving, enabling him too to be merciful. By the way, I'm using this very gender language because I'm translating, I'm using the translation of Arya Carmel, who is the same person who actually edited Mikhtab Meliyahu into Hebrew. So, you know, I figured I should use his translation rather than mine. Um, man has been granted the sublime power of giving, enabling him too to be merciful, to bestow happiness and to give of himself. God created man in his own image. That is Tzalem Elohim. Now, the line that I skipped is also really interesting and important. And here what you see is, right, the extent to which when you read a kind of theological essay, this is true about, you know, in any kind of context, not just in a Jewish context, but when you read a philosophical essay, you can sort of read straightforward words and say, okay, here's his idea. And what ideally you end up filling in over time is, who's he talking to? What's he responding to? Right? So on some level, the line about Salam al is a kind of response to the Rambam, and you could even say it's a kind of very harsh critique, right? Which is, oh, the essence of a human being is his capacity to think? That sounds Greek to me, <laughs> right? The essence of a human being is the capacity to love or to give, right? Now, I'm not taking sides in this. I'm sort of really saying, like, here you're just reading straightforward text, and you actually have a lot going on here. Now, Rav Dessler has this other sort of throwaway comment that is extremely actually important for understanding him, the paragraph that I skipped. Our service to God is not for God's need but for our own, since we need a means of expressing our gratitude to God. Now, 
the claim here in simple English is that the basis of, 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 of avodat Hashem, of service of God, is gratitude. Right? That it is gratitude in us. Not that God needs our gratitude. That's the consequence of saying God is perfect and doesn't need anything. But the, the basis of the spiritual life is our sense of being grateful and the urge to worship that results. That has a long and illustrious history in Jewish thought. Anybody happen to know who the first person to explicitly say, even though it's implicit in other things, that worship of God begins with a sense of gratitude? That is famous argument of Rav Sa'adi Gaon, probably the first kind of systematic Jewish philosopher. It's a very important idea in Rabbi Yubachia's Chavot Halvavot, and it gets picked up by a variety of spiritual and theological thinkers afterwards that the spiritual life begins um, in gratitude. Um, those of you who have heard me teach many times, be convinced I'm not making that up. Um, there's an awful lot of stuff um, in the history of, of, of Mahshev Yisrael, of Jewish thought, that makes precisely that thing. Now, so, he's laid out side one. Tzelem Elohim is the capacity to be a notain. The opposite of Tzelem Elohim, or the repudiation of our Tzelem Elohim, is to become the notail. And um, I'm going to translate that as taker, and we're going to sort of flesh out over time what he means by this. Okay, so I'm going to continue where I was. On the other side stands the faculty of taking, <coughs> by which a person aspires to draw to himself all that comes within his reach. This is what people call egotism or selfishness. It is the root of all evils in the world, which is quite an um, ambitious <coughs> sentence. But... Um, <coughs> Were I translating Rav Dessler today, I would actually translate the no-tail um, as aggressive acquisitiveness. That's what he means by it. It's, it's about, I want everything to be mine. I want sole possession of it. I want it to be unequipped. I need to make it part of me. Why is that the root of all evils in the world for Rav Dessler? I think, okay, and I, this is actually kind of an interesting idea. Because what that is, just think about the physical posture of wanting to make it all mine. It's fundamentally erecting a wall around myself in which nothing outside me makes any claim on me unless it is something that I want for myself, in which case I take it and it's not making a claim on me. Whereas the notain is a posture of open-heartedness and open-handedness. So all good on some level emerges from the notain, and all evil emerges from the notail. Now... There are some people in this room, I feel fairly confident, are thinking, okay, that's a pretty simplistic idea. If you think that, I would say, wait. And also, there are some ideas that are actually so simple and straightforward that they have the potential to pierce through all of our fancy philosophical footwork and actually ask us a very fundamental question. Right? And I think the question of this text is, what's your orientation in life? Not, now, it's both more challenging and less challenging than we might think. It's more challenging in that it's not just asking you, what are you doing in this moment? It's asking you, who are you? It's less challenging in that I don't think it's assuming that the notain, a person who is oriented around the tina, around giving, is incapable of having moments of falling short of that. Right? So an orientation, in other words, is both harder and easier than what you might think. Ultimately, it's harder, but in a moment, it's easier. If I fail at a particular moment, it doesn't mean that my orientation in life is not around giving. Although, if I'm a spiritually aware person, it makes me examine what else is going on inside of me. Okay? So, this is point number one. Okay? Uh, 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 point number one that he's setting up. This is the dichotomy number one. Now... Now he's going to say something that is extremely sweeping, and I, after we finish reading this, I want to take some comments from people about what your initial response um, to this is. He says, these two powers, giving and taking, form the roots of all character traits and all actions. In other words, this is not just an orientation, this is the orientation, according to Rav Dessler. Right? The most fundamental question about who we are as people is, are we oriented? towards the tina or netila. And the Hebrew here is very important. It is about what my she'ifa is. It is about what I aspire to be. It's not merely a description of who I am in my day-to-day -day life, although obviously that is reflective of who I am, but it's also about 
Who do I want to be? What is my aspiration of the kind of person I want to be in the world? Okay? And note, and here's the dramatic statement, which I'll be interested in people's response to, there is no middle way. There is no middle way. Every person is devoted at the deepest level of his personality to one or the other of the two sides. And in the innermost longing of the heart, there are no <coughs> compromises. It is a basic law that there is no middle path in human interest. In every act, in every word, in every thought, one is always devoted either to loving kindness and giving or to grasping and taking. <coughs> Hmm? Did I say human interest? Did I say human interest? Yeah, I don't think I said that. I, 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 okay. Now, so here's my question for you. Does that strike you as obviously true, hard to figure out, or obviously not true? Please. It, it's impossible. Uh, if, you, if you hold by the premise that there's such a thing as reward and punishment, then uh, in any case, you're, you are motivated by either reward or punishment, and then you're either giving or taking. Good. Okay. So first, I think Rav Dessler has a very easy answer to that, even though it's an important challenge, which is to say, if you're, reward, if you're motivated by reward and passion, you remain at a very low spiritual level. And if you're really motivated by reward and punishment, you probably are ultimately a no-tail. A, a no because ultimately, you're not giving at all. Now, this is very hard. In other words, Here's the thing, you know, so if you... But how could that be? How could that be? You are giving. The actions are giving. You're perceived by the world and by the recipient as giving. So uh, even though you have reward in the back, there is a middle way. I, I, I can't... Okay, so hold on. So I think, I think that's a separate question. Let, let, okay, let, let's try to unpack this for a second. First of all, you know, if you had the same Yeshiva Day School teachers I had, you may find this shocking. But, right, a variety... <laughs> of Jewish thinkers have said in various ways that having a religious life that is oriented around scharva onesh, around reward and punishment, means that I remain at a very low spiritual place, right? And ultimately, I, here's an example of this, right? A whole variety of Jewish spiritual texts talk about what is yirah really? What is awe of God really? And they talk about how ultimately I want to get, now I'm, I'm going to come back and undermine what I'm saying in a second. But I want to get beyond what they call yirat ha'onesh, the fear of punishment, and get to the point of yirat ha'romimut, that is, awe in the presence of grandeur. Now, what becomes an interesting question for a lot of those sources is, does that mean that I am merely making yirat ha'onesh less important, or that I'm trying to get rid of it altogether? Right? That's a kind of very important question. What is the role of fear as opposed to awe? in a religious life and a theology, okay? We'll make that question number one. Now, I want to sort of play with your question a little bit, if I could, um, by saying the following. Um, and that is that, first of all, the empirical fact that I may receive rewards either from God or from other people does not necessarily affect, I think Rav Dessler would say, the question of my internal motivation, right? I may decide to act because it's the right thing to do, and people may herald me as great for it. Now, by the way, I think he would admit that's very hard. Because adulation, right, is very compelling to people, right? Affirmation, rewards, right? But I think he's talking... This is why I underline this word she'ifa, right? It's not an empirical description of my situation, it's about who do I want to be in my actions. Now, that said, it might very well be, I can imagine people saying, I can imagine a good thinker, and by the way, not just coming out of some kind of contemporary psychological thinker, but even a traditional Jewish theologian saying, what do you mean? All there is is middle ground. Or an enormous majority, all there is is middle space. Very rarely does anyone engage in an act of pure, unmitigated giving, see the history of philosophy and its obsession with, is there such a thing as altruism, right? And I don't know, probably less rarely, people are, you know, animated by just pure greed. Right? Less rarely, right? But in other words, someone might make the case, all there is is middle ground, and so we should be kind of wrestling with, how do I push myself to one end of the spectrum, 
as opposed to the other? Or how do I, how do I you know, tip the scale so that it's 70-30 as opposed to 30-70? But Rav Dessler will have none of this. And here, I want to just ask a question that you should always think about in religious texts in general, for whatever it's worth, right? I don't... This is genuinely a question. It is not a coy way of making a statement. I just want to make that clear. It's not clear to me that when you read certain religious texts and they make totally emphatic rhetorical statements, that you should assume that were you sitting in Starbucks with that particular figure, they would, over coffee, make the very same claim. Sometimes religious text is hyperbolic in an attempt to move us. In other words, I, I'm just saying, I don't know whether if you were sort of schmoozing with Rav Dessler, this is kind of a great image, schmoozing with Rav Dessler in Starbucks, right? It's a disturbing image on many levels, but you know, I can't imagine Rav Dessler being at Starbucks. But if you said to him, are you really saying that there's no middle ground at all? The answer might be yes, but I don't assume that because he says it this way, the answer is yes. Here, here's a 20th century example of this. Some of the most disturbing lines in the writings of Rabbi Abraham and Joshua Heschel are things like, there is no such thing as a good faith atheist. Right? Atheism is fundamentally a result of character failure. I suspect that what Heschel is doing in those passages is trying to jolt the reader, not make what I would call a discursive claim. He was living in the late 20th century. He was aware that there were plenty of people he liked and respected who were atheists. I could be wrong about that, but I think it's important to understand that rhetoric, and that it's not a dirty word, right? Rhetoric can sometimes be employed to sort of shake us. And I wonder whether there's some rhetorical move here that's about, oh, you want to say, all there is is middle ground. No, make a choice. Who are you? Don't give me this wishy-washy stuff of, oh, well, who am I? I mean, I'm ambivalent. I live, in the, I live in the 21st century. I'm ambivalent. I can't even decide where I want to have lunch. I mean, that's who I am. I'm torn. That's what it means to be human in our day and age. That's what modernity is. I'm ambivalent about everything. Right? Okay, that's nice. But which one are you? I don't know whether that's a philosophical argument or a kind of a sermon. And not like, you know, a usual suburban sermon. It's a sermon. It's basically hitting you in the head and saying like, whoa, no, no, make a choice. What kind of human being are you? So I asked that as a, as, a, as a question to play with and think about. There was one other hand up, I thought. No? Okay. So let's, let's, let's move. Stuff. Yes? Oh, sorry. I'm I, um, so yeah, uh, I forget. If already we're going to frame uh, things in terms of giving and taking, I feel like um, I might want to say, isn't every human action and interaction a mixture of both giving and taking? Good. So, so, um, Rav Dessler is going to complicate his own picture later by saying something that I think is very important and that for me, I almost wonder whether this is kind of laid out by his students in a way that's intended to be suspenseful. He will later on come out and say, wait a second, don't misunderstand me. Taking is not the same thing as receiving. Receiving means that oriented around generosity I enter into relationships that have reciprocity to them. Reciprocity is my word, not his. But that taking is about grabbing. He uses at some point in here the language of chatifa, right? It is about grabbing, right? Is that right here? Yeah. Yeah. He, I, I'm going to grab this, right? That's taking. Receiving is, oh, you want to share that with me? The danger, he says, is how insidious it is. And, you know, I ask as a sort of rhetorical question, not because I know the answer, just because I don't want to have this discussion right now, but thinking to think about, to what extent do you recognize this in yourself? Do we recognize this in ourselves? That it's very easy in moments of receiving to very easily be converted to taking. Oh, you're giving me a gift? You know what you become? An object that gives things to me. In other words, he wants to be sort of really kind of emphatic about how easy it is to cease to see the other person and actually just see them as one more thing I can take from. So I think it's richer, Avi, than you are. Um, when I first taught this text, um, Vicki Abrams said to me, what about reciprocity? I think he has plenty of space for reciprocity here. It's just about, but here's what he doesn't have. And, and, and this is, again, I mean, we can come back and talk about this later. I don't think he has the idea that, oh, our ideal should be the aspiration towards reciprocity problematic as that might be to some of us, right? 
He wants to say no as an ideal, as an aspiration. We still have to choose. Now, choosing nitina, choosing giving, doesn't eliminate the possibility of reciprocity, but the aspiration, in his mind anyway, is still towards nitina. Just to be plain, lay my cards on the table, I'm not sure what I think about this. Right? I, I think it's just like a really interesting, um, and rhetorically, it's quite um, jarring. Which I think it's part of what it's going to do. Yeah. If everybody Could you speak up? If everybody should assume the posture of giving, who are going to be the recipients? Great. He's going to talk about that explicitly, and he's going to say, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to apologize to you because I'm going to play with you. He's going to say that's exactly the wrong question, because. <laughs> Because in a world of Nitina, everyone is a recipient. They're just not taking. They're not taking, they're receiving. Taking is about, taking in Rav Dessler has an almost violent tinge to it. I'm going to, I, I almost, I'm almost tempted to say, you know, I said aggressive acquisitiveness. You might even say no tail is not taking, but grabbing. Right? So in a world where everyone gives, there's no need for grabbing. There's on some level no possibility of who would grab in a world of utter generosity, right? You know, Louis, right? And we live in a world that even makes sense to us to imagine. But I, I, I think you're really getting to exactly where he wants to kind of lay out that, of course, in a world of giving, there are people who receive. They're just not people who take. We'll come back to this, okay? Let, let, we'll, we'll come back to it. Um, that's where I think, by the way, it begins to be a little richer than you might think at first reading, right? It's more complicated than. The simple rhetorical, okay, make a choice. Okay. Now, this part two that I want to show you is just an interesting example of how Musar reworks a text it receives. Um, and Rav Dessler is here going to quote, it's, it's kind of an amazing, um, I'm going to call this, for lack of a better language, and I will probably regret this as soon as I say it, a kind of ethical critique of being preoccupied with ecstatic experiences. Right? Right? Religious life as, you know, wow, that was an amazing short answer. Just blew me away how spiritually connected I am. Right? Now, because, because that is what one great Buddhist thinker calls a form of spiritual materialism, right? Where I'm just collecting religious experiences. And it excuses me, potentially, not noticing the people in front of me, because after all, I'm sorry you're suffering, but right now I'm having mystical union, whatever that is. Right? Right? I'm, I'm sorry. Right? But, okay. Now, so, so, nice to see you, Shira. Uh, so, so here's the thing. So, um, he's now going to offer this really interesting rereading of a Midrash. He seems to think that this Midrash is from the time of Chazal. Um, we know Midrash Talpiot that he's quoting is a medieval Midrash. One of the ways we know that is it's totally... Um, inflected with very explicit Kabbalistic language that is post-Chazal, it is after them. Nevertheless, what he's going to do is say, oh, you think that's what this text means? It means the exact opposite. Okay? So I'm going to sort of read this, and then we'll um, quickly talk about it. He says, the Torah writes of Chanoch, who was the seventh generation after Adam, and Chanoch walked with God, upon which the rabbis, again, these Midrash Kalpiyot, say, Chanoch, Chanoch was a cobbler, and with every sti single stitch that he made, he achieved mystical unions with his creator. Miyachi Yichudim. He was... Now, um, here's a little context for this. There's a lot of voices in the history of Jewish thought that basically argue for what I would call divided consciousness. Right? Arguably, that's kind of what the Rambam argues for at the end of the guide, arguably. Right? Oh... You have to do stuff in this world? That's fine. Like, do it, but your, let your mind be on metaphysical truth. Don't, to the extent that you can, don't fully be there. Right? Rav Dessler, quoting Rabbi Yisrael Salanter, is going to say, no, 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 no. I reject that emphatically. Right? And here's how, how he does it. He says, I have heard a beautiful explanation of this in the name of Rabbi Yisrael Salanter, of blessed memory, that is, the founder of the Musar movement, who is very much revered by everyone in this tradition, an interpretation which is indeed typical of his whole approach. He said that this Midrash cannot possibly mean that while he was sitting and stitching shoes for his customers, his mind was engaged on mystical pursuits. This would be forbidden by halakha. It would be forbidden by the day. How can you do that? 
Meaning, what does that mean? How could he divert his attention to other matters while engaged on work, which he had been hired to do by others? Oh, I'm sorry that you hired me to do shoes, but I'll give it 15% of my time. But the other 85% of my time is unified with the divine. But wait, I paid you to do a job for me. It's actually a sore for you to be in a state of ecstasy right now. It is forbidden. You have to do what I asked you to do. So he says, it's inconceivable that the shot of this midrash is what it seems to be. No, says Rabbi Yisrael, the mystical unions which Hanoch achieved were nothing more nor less than the concentration which he lavished on each and every stitch to ensure that it would be good and strong and that the pair of shoes he was making would be a good pair, giving the maximum pleasure and benefit to whoever would wear them. In this way, Hanoch achieved union with the attribute of, of the Creator, who lavishes his goodness and beneficence on others. Now, it's very important not to read this too quickly, because Rabbi Yisrael Salanter is having attributed to here something that is really, really amazing, right? Which is, be very careful about the notion that, oh, you shouldn't be in this world, because, or you should be in this world as minimally as possible, because you really should be focused on some kind of metaphysical or theurgic, right, trying to somehow affect the cosmos by connecting with God. He says, no, 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 no. What does it mean to be unified with God? To be unified with God's generosity. To be unified with God's goodness, such that I am fully present in the act of giving to another. This is, you know, it's interesting that Rav Dessler doesn't quote this. Um, this, the, the pasuk that you almost expect him to quote here um, is Bechol Drachecha Da'ehu, right? That you should know God in whatever you're doing. Um, and it, that's really about being fully, fully present. You can't ever sacrifice the person who you are in any kind of relationship with, professional or more intimate, for some abstract union that you're trying to achieve. Um, you have to be where you're called to be and where you've agreed to be, there and only there. So mystical union, quote unquote, for Rav Dessler actually is about ethics and specifically about generosity. And it's a very powerful model. And, and it's worth asking, now I understand that this is not necessarily an either-or question, but in the spirit of Rav Dessler's rhetoric, I want to couch it that way, right? Which is, how do you imagine being unified with God? Is it about, you know, what happens um, on Friday night during one particular paragraph of L'Chad Odi? Or, right, is it about God has the best interests of every human being in mind? I connect to God by trying to tap into that love and generosity. <coughs> now, again, I understand one could say, oh, wait, that or is problematic. But again, the, the rhetoric here is very powerful, which is be careful about sort of celebrating your own experience. The person who's, by the way, most kind of in, in, in 20th century language powerful about this, so we probably wouldn't talk about this before, is Buber, who, as Buber, Buber, as he gets older, becomes more and more suspicious of people who are focused on ecstatic experiences. First of all, he thinks that they're impossible, but second of all, he also thinks, he also thinks that they're dangerous. And they're dangerous. He has this wonderful distinction, um, which is, even if you don't fully embrace it, it's worth like spending a large chunk of our lives wrestling with it. Um, the distinction between what he calls encounter on the one hand and experience on the other. Right? Encounter for Hoover is the highest form of relation. It means there's you and there's me, and there is a space between us. Experience for Buber is basically, for mature Buber, is a dirty word. Experience means, this is now my language, not his, right? There's me, and there's the way you make me feel. But there's no you, not really, because I'm in love with my own experience. All there is, is me. And in, in, in the lectures that lead up to the writing of I and Now, he has this phrase, I'm probably remembering it more or less right, but I want to emphasize more or less. He talks about what he calls the self-pleasuring of aestheticizing souls. Yeah. Classic Buber speak, which essentially means people who are just in love with their own experience of otherness. Oh, wow. Right? That was amazing, right? Like, right now, what am I doing? 
I am being extremely generous with you. You are a vehicle for my goodness. As opposed to you are in front of me and there's a space between us that is actually real. Right? That's Buber's central argument. And in some ways, I'm not sure that Buber and Ruf Dessler would have liked the association, but in some ways Ruf Dessler is saying something that's actually quite similar. Just it's actually about being there. And the connection to God happens in the moment of actually being fully there, doing what I'm supposed to do for the other. Um, okay, now he says, just I'm skipping one sentence, there could be no question of his ever deceiving or overreaching his customers, even unwittingly. His taking would never exceed the value of the work he was doing, the measure of his giving. Okay, so there's a kind of interesting, again, sort of critique of a preoccupation with ecstatic experience. And I really just think this is like, I, I want you to sort of say, maybe a powerful corrective for a lot of the way um, American and American Jewish spirituality is sometimes prone to talking, right? Which is, oh, you want to have an ecstatic <coughs> connection with God? Be really present with the person in front of you and do what you've committed to doing for them, right? That's Tveku. By the way, it's an amazing statement. It's not even that that's the halachta bedrachav, walking in God's ways. It, it's, that's, that is absolute boundness to God. You are bound to God in the moment of doing that. This is kind of an anti-ecstatic <laughs> way of, of thinking, but it's, it's intended as also, as I think, a kind of critique. Um, okay, I want to read one more passage, and then we'll take some more comments and thoughts. Um, it's common in a lot of what we'll call simplistically postmodern ethics to say that what ethics requires <laughs> is to see the other in all her otherness. As opposed to, I'm being incredibly simplistic in the presence of actual philosophers in this room, um, in the presence of modern ethics, to basically allow myself to say, oh, what is the other? I discovered the similarity between me and her. And so on some level, yeah, I mean, there's a kind of self-interest because she and I are in some ways the same thing. And so that's how I generate a sense of my obligation. Meaning, do I say, oh, I'm obligated to you because you and I are just alike? Or am I obligated to you because you and I are totally different? <clears throat> right? I would say that here, on the one hand, when Rav Dessler lays out the notain notail model, he is what you would call a total ethical idealist. Folks, there is no middle ground. But when it comes to what the dynamic between me and another person looks like, he is very much willing to kind of confront that, on some level, human beings need to discover sameness in order to feel ethically compelled by someone. Right? This is not Levinas. It's a very different way. I mean, Rav Re Re Dessler would say this is kind of a realistic ethic, which is perhaps ironic in light of what we've just seen. But, okay, so here's what he says. Um, here we come to an interesting question. By the way, I should say that these are excerpts, meaning this is not the entire essay, and if you'd like the entire essay, feel free to be in touch with me. Here we come to an interesting question. We see that love and giving always come together. Very interesting here. Is giving the consequence of love, or is perhaps the reverse true? Is the love a result of the giving? Now, I want to come back to this in a minute, because this is about one of the most interesting questions in the history of ethics and moral psychology, which is, to what extent can we take responsibility for our feelings? I'll come back to that in a minute. We usually think it is love which causes giving, because we observe that a person showers gifts and favors on the one he loves. But there is another side to the argument. Giving may bring about love for the same reason that a person loves what he himself has created or nurtured. He recognizes in it <clears throat> part of himself. Now, in a way, we could stop right here, right? The notion that giving generates love because love is the discovery of the ways in which you and I are similar is this kind of, I'm calling this not in the technical philosophical sense, just to be clear, a kind of ethical realism. Oh, how is it that I come to care about you? I discover that you and I are the same in some fundamental way. As opposed to the much more kind of demanding, ambitious notion that, oh, I am called by the sheer otherness of who you are. And I would ask you, by the way, sort of in your own understanding of like ethical responsibility, 
right? How do you think about that? I'm not convinced, by the way, that anybody really ethically has an ethical pull that's actually about the absolute otherness of the other. I'm actually not totally convinced that's psychologically possible. But, but Rav Dessler doesn't even want to play that. He says straight out, right? What it means is, right, I discover the ways that you and I are the same. And how do I discover it? And this is kind of the next point that is really, 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 I think, interesting and important and has implications for the way we go through the world on a regular basis, which is, can we take responsibility for the way we feel? It is very common, sort of, I think, American idiom, but that's just the way I feel. I mean, I just, I just don't feel that way. I mean, what do you want from me? I just don't, right? And as if, right, emotions are something over which we lack um, almost any control. And so I would ask here a question, which is, can we will to feel a certain way? Can we decide to have a particular emotional response? And just to play with this for a second, I want to take three people's first response to that question. Can we will to feel a particular way? No. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Okay. <laughs> Fabulous. Okay. So let's take one voice that says no. Whoever said no, speak up. Why no? To speak up, though, because... Oh, I, I, I don't have any argument for it. It's going to come naturally. You can, you can be honest about them and aware of them, and you can make decisions on your behavior, but your feelings come... For, I mean, you, you can do behavior that might affect your feelings, but your feelings are not something you can control. Good, okay. So, you offered a very interesting caveat at the end, which I want to come back to, but you're basically saying that... Is it fair to say that you just said emotions are events that happen to us rather than decisions that we make? Yes, you can think that you're making a decision, but you, it would be dishonest. Okay. It would not be dishonest, it would be self-deceptive. Self right? 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 Okay. Um, someone who said, someone, someone else said emphatically yes. Oh, someone on this side. Bethany. Of course. Of course. Okay. <laughs> Unlike me, you speak like normal people and say, of course, as opposed to emphatically. Yes. So now, why don't you explain what, what, why you said, of course? Because I think emotions are necessarily tied up in the narratives that we tell about the experiences we're having. And that if I feel like I'm being told that I'm not worthy, or I'm not enough, or I'm not good enough, or Anybody want to say this question is impossible to answer? A lot of people just said yes without saying yes, based on people's facial responses. Okay, so, you know, this question has obvious ramifications for our interpersonal relationships. It also has implications <coughs> for our religious lives, like the following small question in Jewish spirituality. Can I be commanded to love God? How can you command me to feel something? Right? One of the things that leads all kinds of people to run and say is, well, by love, I mean here action, right? One of the issues they're struggling with is, how can you do that? How can you command someone to love? Or how can you command someone to directly will to love? You might be able to shape yourself. Okay, so now, um, and by the way, it's not just love of God. I mean. Here are three important Jewish ideas in the Chumash. Love God with all your heart. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love the stranger. Three loves of Chumash, right? What if I can't do that? Or what if I can't decide to do that? And in other words, it's a question not just for ethics, but also for, let's call it theology, piety, spirituality, whatever language you want to use. It's a really fundamental question. But here is, I think, how Rav Dessler implicitly wants to think about this. Um, and it goes to your the little caveat, in a way. I know you didn't mean it as a caveat, but I'm sort of spinning it that way. Um, which is, we may not be able to will to feel something directly, but we can indirectly will to feel something by choosing to act and live in certain ways that are likely to elicit those feelings. And that's what it means to obey the commandments to feel in particular ways. That's very important. I want to just sort of like sort of reiterate that for a second. It's a very interesting notion. Again, I'm abstracting from what he's about to say, but I think 
an awful lot of philosophers would say similar things and have, right? I may not be able to decide to feel grateful, but I can be responsible for cultivating gratitude, right? I may not be able to decide to love you, but I can treat you in such a way and live in such a way that is likely to elicit gratitude. It's in, in, psycho in psychology, without getting lost in this, this is like a positive version of cognitive dissonance. Right? If I, if I act lovingly enough, often enough, to you, there's a reasonable chance I will come to love you. Now that may be jarring for some people. Wait, am I manipulating myself? No, I'm just being responsible for how human beings work. Right? And we don't tend to work by saying, okay, I'm now going to go into my study and meditate until I love you, right? <laughs> now, it might work sometimes, but the idea is there's, there are more concrete ways to elicit those feelings. That's what I'm, I'm calling, you know, indirect willing of feelings, as opposed to direct willing of feelings. By the way, the same thing is parallel, this is probably not a word, parallelly true of can you be commanded to believe in God, which is not an emotion, but it has a parallel internal structure, which is one 20th century philosopher coined the term, as only a philosopher could, to volit. To volit means to choose to believe something. Are human beings capable of voliting? Right? Are they capable, are they capable of voliting? Can I say, okay, I now make a decision that I believe. One can say only the most whacked out as existentialist would even consider that as a possibility. Right? Again, decide to believe, ah, but what can I do? I can do all kinds of things that have the potential to elicit that faith. In other words, I can sort of choose as a goal belief. Similarly, I can choose as a goal love. I want to take response to this in a minute, but first I want to see Rav Dessler's words. All of this is my attempt to abstract from a very simple thing he says. Part four. It was explained in the previous chapter that every human being possesses some spark of the faculty of giving. In other words, the faculty of taking has not been given the power to extinguish this last spark. This is what I meant before when I said, right, you can undermine your koach hanetina, but you can't fully abrogate it. There's always some capacity for giving that remains. It is essential that this should be so, for the world depends on it for its very existence. Without that vestigial spark of giving, no one would marry or have children. And by the way, he, he goes to great lengths to emphasize that I think it's quite you know, beautiful that there's no better way to learn um, the power of giving than through, and now I'm adding because I think it's important, an ideal, close parentheses, family life. Right? Marriage depends on an aspiration towards giving. A marriage, he says, that is rooted in taking, says, I've counseled these couples. It takes a few months and they don't love each other anymore. If they ever love each other. If it's all about, I marry you because of what you can do for me, see ya. Right? It's over. If I marry you because I am moved to give to you, and you are moved to give to me, then there's, right, something else becomes possible. Um, again, the challenge of, wait, shouldn't we talk about reciprocity more explicitly here, is important. Okay. Now, here he says something that is both the basis of what I was saying before and actually quite, you know, again, in its simplicity, quite a challenge. He says, since most people's power of giving remains at this vestigial level, they tend to restrict their giving and their love to a narrow circle of relatives and friends. They look on everyone else as strangers and deal with them in ways dominated by the power of taking, envy, exploitation, grasping, and greed rule the dead. If only one to one, if if one were only to reflect that a person comes to love the one to whom he gives, he would realize that the only reason the other person seems a stranger to him is because he has not yet given to him. He has not taken the trouble to show him friendly concern. If I give to someone, I feel close to him. I have a share in his being. This, by the way, you know, is another one of these examples of, it's so simple, but it's actually sort of arresting. He basically says, oh, you tell me you don't give people because you don't love them. But actually, you have that exactly wrong. The reason you don't love them is because you've never tried giving them. And by the way, just to shatter some commonly held stereotypes among Jews, this is a Haredi thinker, right, who 
is actually talking very explicitly about expanding the circle of who matters to you and whom you love. Right? And that it's not okay. Right? This is the sort of standard, sort of like, everyone is not a Haredi attacks Haredi for this purported failure, right? Haredi don't care about anyone themselves. You know what Desser is saying? Yeah, that's a profound moral failure if it's true. And I'm telling you that actually the reason why you may have trouble, you and the third person, anyone, right, may have trouble loving other people is because you've never tried being generous. If you try being generous, you have the capacity to elicit love in yourself. Now, there's something, I think, counterintuitive to a kind of, I, mean, I think this is true, I mean, you can tell me if you think this is wrong, to a certain kind, certain kind of American ethos that says, you know, my integrity dictates that I will never do anything unless I feel it 100%. I think what Desser says, well, good luck, because you're going to spend your whole life sitting in a chair doing nothing, right? And actually, that's just not the way it works. If there's something that you want to come to feel 100%, you have to choose first to act in a way that would elicit that. The, the, the text that he may have in mind here that, you know, is quoted by pretty much, you know, everyone after the writing of this book is one of the refrains of Sefer HaChinuch, right? kind of medieval spiritual guidebook um, who says that our hearts are pulled by our actions rather than our actions being pulled by our hearts. That's what I was calling before the positive version of cognitive dissonance, right? Where we elicit feelings in ourselves by acting in particular ways. Um, and that's what he's trying to get us, um, get us to to get over the idea that we should give because we love and discover within us the possibility that we could love because we give. Okay. Now, I want to move forward just to sort of, with this next <coughs> one level more interesting for a Dessler is with the claim that gratitude derives from and is only possible when one is oriented towards giving. Say that one more time. Gratitude derives from and is only possible when one is oriented towards giving. The notel is incapable of hakaratato. Why is that? Give me the sort of psychological logic of that. Why should it be I mean, at some level, it's very simple, right? But what, why should it be? Why, why would you make that claim? That giving is the basis. Being oriented to giving is the basis for gratitude. And if you're oriented to taking, it's impossible to be grateful. Yeah, I don't think you're grateful okay, great. Do people hear what Lana just said? The taker, Lana said, feels entitled. <coughs> and so it's hard to feel grateful for that which you feel entitled to anyway. Um, almost all psychological literature on gratitude talks about exactly this point, right? The ultimate poison for the possibility of gratitude is sort of not like a profound or shattering insight. It's a sense of entitlement. If it already belongs to me, I'm not going to be grateful to you for it. Especially when you think about this very interesting idea, right? Very common in psychology and in some moral philosophy, that the definition of gratitude is a response to that which I have been given that is more than I had a right to. In other words, gra translate that into, gratitude means you gave me something I wasn't entitled to. Entitlement means I can't be grateful. The notel, on some level, feels, according to our Dessler, that it's all his. And what isn't his is only not his yet in the current political arrangement, but it ought to be. Right? It ought to be mine. That's the definition of greed. Right? It, it all ought to be mine. And so the argument is, right, that how should we how should we say this? The argument is that if I'm oriented to giving, everything I receive is a pleasant surprise that I don't feel I have coming to. If I'm oriented towards taking. Everything I get, on some level, already belonged to me anyway. So in other words, I, I, I want to sort of just play this out for a second. This is like a really interesting claim. 
that gratitude is inherently tied to an ethos of generosity. It's more than that, not tied to. You cannot be grateful unless you are fundamentally generous. If you are ungenerous, you will never end up being grateful. I'm just wondering if the Mateo... Speak up a little louder. If the Mateo cannot be grateful because he feels dependent upon the giver. And when you're dependent upon somebody, you might even feel a certain amount of resentment. Great. So th there's a lot to say here. Um, it is true, this is actually something I'm, I've been writing about, that resistance to dependence, and close to dependence here is vulnerability, resistance to dependence and vulnerability is toxic for the possibility of feeling grateful, which is one of the reasons that for a kind of healthy interpersonal life, let alone a kind of robust spiritual life, one of the requirements is embracing, find a way to embrace dependence and vulnerability. I don't think that's the same as actively seeking out neediness, but it's acknowledging, reminded of a wonderful line um, in Mark Twain, right? The self-made man is as likely as a self-laid egg. <laughs> right? Everyone is dependent. Everyone depends on the generosity. Every human being in the world depended on the generosity of others. If you don't think that's true, take a look at any infant and ask yourself how many minutes they could live left on their own. Even people who have had bad parents in many ways are dependent on their parents for that fact. And real relationship on some level is about acknowledging dependence and vulnerability. By the way, an interesting place where this plays out is in the 10th chapter of Hilchot Matnot Aniyim in the Rambam. When the Rambam talks about um, the laws of tzedakah, that parak is very, very interesting. Um, he begins by saying you should work extremely hard not to be dependent on gifts from the community. Right? This is part of the Rambam's whole ethos of not having others support you. Right? There's a value in that. Right? And then he says, if, however, you actually need help and you refuse to ask it, you are shofech damim. It's like an amazing one. He said, if you, if you get to the point where you realize you are needy, but you can't ask, you are a murderer. Now, we could spend a lot of time trying to figure out what that rhetorical flourish means. Um, Rabbi David Hartman actually suggests in an essay, and I, I have a feeling this is a little midrashic, but it's kind of a beautiful image. He says, what does the Rambam mean by saying you're a murderer? By absolutely refusing your own dependence, even in a moment of absolute need, you are diminishing your own humanity. You think you are obsessed with, oh, my autonomy? You know what? First of all, absolute autonomy is overrated. Second of all, it's a fiction. Yes, the desire to support myself, the desire not to sort of just, you know, cast myself on the support of others is a value. But yish gvulah davar, right? There's a limit there. And the limit is, right, the Rambam's, the dialectic is very powerful. If you never look at it, look at that 10th chapter of Yilchot Sagat. It's amazing. Like, he says as emphatically as he can, don't depend on others. And if you do depend on others and you refuse to acknowledge it, you're a murderer. It's like, right, it's pulling the, the, the rope on both ends really, really powerfully. So I think you're right, right? How can we learn to be dependent in ways that are not um, inducing of resentment? I think, is it... Um, who is it who says, it's one of the American transcendentalists who says um, that all human beings hate the hand that feeds them. It's a very sort of cynical description, and it sort of fits with an ethos of self-reliance and all that kind of stuff, right? We hate the hand that feeds us. Now, that's a very cynical view, and one of the things we might want to do here is wean ourselves, all of us individually, in our own biographical narratives, away from thinking that being dependent on people who have been manipulative and controlling of us equals what it means to be dependent altogether. Right? <laughs> All of us have probably had experiences where, um, right? I mean, the example of this that I like to give is, you know, the neighbor, I'm having a hard time financially, my neighbor gives me a loan of $5,000 and spends the rest of her life telling me just how wonderfully generous she has been to me. <laughs> right? That kind of dependence is understandably very difficult for people. That's negative indebtedness. That's the kind of indebtedness that makes me want to flee. But the kind of indebtedness that I feel to someone who was loving to me in a moment of sorrow, 
or who gave me and genuinely never wanted to be asked about it again, right, is actually the kind of indebtedness that enables me to acknowledge that being alive means having needs, and needs that I can't simply meet on my own. Americans have a harder time with this. It's actually psychological studies that say that when you, when you ask people from different <coughs> countries about how comfortable they feel with gratitude and indebtedness, Americans always rank near the bottom of kind of unable to embrace of gratitude and indebtedness. And that's part of the ethos of me. Or de Tocqueville, when he came here to talk about this, right? Ethos of individuals, right? You just, right? And there's something damaging with that. And Rav Dessler, I think, would say, well, that's not the kind of part of what he's saying here, right? You have to be willing to be dependent if you want to be grateful. But dependent in a, again, you know, not dependent in the sense of abdicating my dignity, but dependent in the sense of acknowledging when I might need to receive. Not take, receive. Okay. Uh, hold on one second. What? I can't even see my watch. 8.35. Okay. Um, um, let me read one. Let me talk about one more passage, and then I'll take another round of comments. Okay? Um, I want to just sort of get to that piece. If you look at passage, um, well, we never read five. Five is where he actually talks about this notion of gratitude um, derived from being oriented towards giving. But if you look at six, this is really the question of taking versus receiving. Since it is true that there can be no giving without someone receiving what is given, truly giving itself leads to evil. Surely the giver makes the recipient the taker. It follows, too, that there can never be a perfected world. If all human beings were to become givers, who would there be to take from them? Right? He quoted you, like almost verbatim, right? <laughs> right? Now these are interesting questions. Now these are interesting questions, he says. But if we devote a little more thought to the subject, we shall see that the matter is really self-explanatory. There is a great difference between a recipient and a taker. A notel and a mechabel are not the same thing. Right? A notel and a mechabel are not the same thing at all. Right? A taker and a receiver are not the same thing. And similarly, he says, between a giver and one for whom things are taken, from whom things are taken. We would do well not to confuse these concepts. And then he will lay out this whole kind of typology of there is a type of person who takes and lets people take from him. This is the one who is possessed by the power of taking. His taking arises from self-love. He wants only to take and would much prefer not to give at all. If anything is taken from him, this is only because he is unable to prevent it. There is another person, one who gives and receives. He is the giver, whose giving flows from the source of pure goodness in his heart, and whose receiving immediately fills his heart with gratitude in payment for whatever <coughs> he receives. Now, what, what, what's, what's sort of like, um, I think, important and, and striking here is, this is already very close to talking about reciprocity. But the claim is, and again, like I don't want to dilute his claim. The claim is, I don't want to defend the claim, I just want to make sure you understand it, because I think it's really interesting and provocative, that real reciprocity becomes possible only when both members of the relationship are oriented towards giving rather than taking. Now I understand, right? Someone might say no, right? Reciprocity becomes possible when both members of the relationship are oriented towards taking when they need to and giving when they can. But Dester thinks, you know, that is morally compromised. The only way real reciprocity can happen is by being more ambitious. This is like a weird formulation. Being more ambitious in our self-transcendence. Right? We have to want to get over ourselves more deeply than that. Yeah, it's a really interesting claim. Okay. Um, I want to take a bunch of comments now, and then we'll kind of back this up. Let's, let's start with people who haven't spoken yet, and then I'm going to come to people who have. Anybody, anything they want to say? Please. I have a superficial question going back Great. to the beginning of the show. Um, if we, if we're, we're labeling Chanoch as this, you know, this person of generosity and the quintessential you know, element of givingness among people, and that's what, that's what makes him so unique among men, and why is it that, the, that it's recorded so simply that God takes him. Um, okay, so I'm, I want to give you a totally uninteresting answer and then <laughs> an only mildly uninteresting answer. Okay? The totally uninteresting answer is, 
reminded of something that um, James Coco says about Midrash. Midrash is about psukim, not narratives. Um, now, that's not that interesting what it's called. Meaning it's not about, right? It doesn't have to answer that question. Now, only slightly less is this, which is, why are you so convinced that God took him as a punisher? Maybe God took him because God recognized how attached to God he was, and God wanted to hold him close to God's bosom. I'm really glad I finally got to publicly refer to the expression God's bosom. <laughs> maybe, God, maybe God actually felt like this person deserves to live with me. Why, what, why, why does Sarah assume that it's condemnatory? Why not? I'm just, even by taking him and holding him closer, he's, take, he's now taking away his, his ability to give. So that is really interesting, right? Which is, that, now, how is this for kind of shaking our assumptions? You know why death is such a tragedy? Because we cease to be able to give. That's like, all right, that's a lot differently than most of us think about dying. Um, and that's already a really interesting challenge to the text. And I'm not really sure what to say about it. Um, you know, if anyone wants to play with that idea, you're, you're totally welcome to. Um, I mean, the kind of thing Ruf Dessler would not say that some more cynical types would say is a person like Hanot is not really able to live in the world as it is. The world as it is is unworthy of someone like Hanot. The problem with that sort of approach is that it ends up being sort of an ugly place if it says only a Schmendrix can live here. <laughs> and, and you know what I mean? I don't like, like where that leaves us. But I don't know. Now that you phrase it like in that way, I think it becomes, if not, that is. The opposite of a superficial question. It's really like very powerful. And to think about death that way. By the way, Heschel says something. Um, if you ever want to sort of see two very different temperaments, I mean, I should say you could read Soloveitchik and Heschel on almost anything, but read Soloveitchik and Heschel on death. Rabbi Soloveitchik goes to great lengths um, in Isha Halacha and other places to talk about how the religious person is terrified of dying. Terrified of dying. I mean, terrified of dying. Doesn't want to die. <clears throat> Heschel, in lines that I think for a lot of us articulate a kind of piety that is far beyond our <coughs> says, for a righteous person, what's so frightening about dying? God gave us the gift of life, and it's our one opportunity to return. Death is a moment of reciprocity, potentially. Death is homecoming. Now, I understand, by the way, you could say, the following thoughts could emerge from this. Number one, Soloveitchik's view is profoundly disturbing and spiritually problematic. Number two, Soloveitchik's view is profoundly rooted in the Jewish tradition and feels more plausible and connected to our experience of death. Number three, Heschel's view is totally beautiful but beyond my reach. Number four, Heschel's view is totally unrealistic and I thought we're a religion that values being alive almost above all things except for a few. Right? All of those are legitimate responses, and, and, and they're really interesting. And without being sort of psychologically reductionist, what you may learn more than anything else when you first read those is how differently temperamented those two people are. Right? One of them is, at least at the beginning, an existentialist, who's I think later is an existentialist whose fundamental experience of the world is being thrown lonely and afraid. The other one is a person whose experience begins with wonder, gratitude, and the amazing fact that he exists. It all, you know, can be said to proceed from there. Um, is one of those, we use a kind of more authentic way of being religious? Uh, I would never presume to say that. They're actually just very interesting models. Um, okay, no other questions or comments? Yeah, please. Of 
rhetorical sermon. I'm not sure. Okay, let me try to say this in as straightforward a way as I can, and then maybe we can complicate it a little bit. What tshuva means is that I can be a no-tail for the last 25 years and decide that tomorrow I'm going to be different. In other words, I don't think there's any sort of like fixed essentializing of, of who is an O'Tain and who is an O'Tail. I don't think so. I'm not kind of, if I may be permitted to speak Yeshiva for a second, I'm not quite holding in Desler enough to really be able to say that definitively, but I think that that's probably true. I don't know, Shmuel, you know this book? I, I, I think... Um, I think he would say, it's not like, oh, and by the way, if he said this, it would undermine almost everything the Muslim movement is about, which makes it unlikely that he would say it, right? Which is, oh, I made a decision when I was 23, I went off the path of goodness, I became totally greedy, acquisitive, I stopped being able to see the other in her reality and her needs, and it's too late for me now. That's a rejection of tshuva, freedom. So, again, the dichotomy is actually potentially an incentive to question my orientation rather than essentialize the world. You know, there are passages where it, it feels like this, so I, I don't, you know, maybe this is me, not him talking. I think one thing that one would want to avoid doing most of the time is walking around in one's life. I'm not going to go around the room and label you no tain, no tail. No tail, right? Major no tail. Rasha. Rasha Gamur, right? I don't think you're supposed to do that. There are moments when Rav Dessler sort of does sort of begin to talk that way, where he basically says, oh, if you see someone who's a no-tail, and you see him expressing gratitude, know that he's mitchanef, right? It's manipulative, right? He's, he's a sycophant. He's trying to gain more. He's already in favor. He does have those moments. But there, too, I wonder if it's rhetorical. So I don't know if I'm really answering your question, but what I'm sort of suggesting is, as long as the, 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 the reality of notating no tail is fundamentally fluid, I think it avoids what you're accusing him of. Not accusing him, I don't mean to get strongly, but you know, the, the, the fault you're finding with him, I think a little bit is answered by a preoccupation with the radical reality of human freedom and our capacity to change. Absolutely. I mean, yeah, but I think that at that point, Rav Dessa would say, <clears throat> that giving is a form of taking. Right? Someone who, and this is where, you see, it's much more, I really want to sort of argue, if I can only argue one point about this text, it is much more sophisticated and eludes our attempt to caricature it than it, it seems the first 15 times we encounter. Like, you keep, you, when, when, when you kind of keep getting at what he's saying, He's actually saying things that are really psychologically very profound, right? The person who gives and is totally smug about that is actually using the people she's giving to and taking from them, right? It's all about my reputation, right? It's all about, right, how I look. How many people's religious life is about that? I don't forget about religious life. I mean, life of service. I mean, I don't mean I'm not picking on religion in particular. You're also picking on religion, but not only picking on religion, right? In other words, there's the possibility of, oh, I really, really, I know I look like a tzaddik, and I convince myself that I'm a tzaddik, and meanwhile, actually what I'm doing is, right, filling the hole, now, now I'm kind of using more psychological language than he seems to go to, I'm filling the holes in myself by convincing myself that I'm, like, wonderfully amazing and unique. And by the way, what always happens in that case, <coughs> right, this is a different discussion, it is so hard. I would say if there's one fundamental spiritual challenge in giving, it is to avoid the temptation, which is almost unavoidable for many people, especially when they're being honest, of imagining that we're superior to the people we're giving to. Right? I mean, I don't need to multiply examples of that. There are crude examples, but I think what Desser would be interested in is much more subtle examples. Oh, right? You're having trouble making ends meet? Oh, I'll, I'll give you some money, but don't think about it twice. And meanwhile, I'm thinking, oh, you know, I would never be in that situation. I mean, the moment I say that, I've already decided that I'm superior to that person. 
So I, in other words, I just think there's a tremendous amount of complexity here, right? <coughs> um, it is true that a lot of giving um, leads to smugness. By the way, an awful lot of being religious leads to smugness, right? I hate to say it, right? But if there's one sort of cardinal sin of like religious people, it's probably that. Oh, God loves me. That's why I'm upper class and from, right? Because God loves me and it's given me all the blessings that I could possibly need, right? I'm actually not kidding here, right? This is really deep stuff, right? As opposed to the sort of humility saying, you know what? None of this actually belongs to me, right? None of this, belo- none of this is mine. I didn't earn- How much is that I really earn? How much is that I really earn? How much is this dumb luck? I remember once a friend of mine who was a very inflammatory philanthropist, who loved to be a <laughs> philanthropist, walking into a room with one of the Jewish community's most, promising, most prominent billionaires and saying, you know, you are really, and there were some expletives there, lucky. And this person sort of like was very taken aback. No one speaks in a way. He said, okay, to make a lot of money in business, you have to have some talent. To make as, money, as much money as you've had, you're just lucky. <laughs> <laughs> and in other words, right, there's all, the human temptation to congratulate ourselves is like probably one of the most stubborn needs or horrors we have. Um, and I'll just say, sort of personally, what scares me the most is the ways in which, right, religion can often um, stoke those embers rather than still them. Right, where religion becomes a form of posturing superiority. And please, I want to just say one last, one last request. Be very careful if you heard me say that and are now thinking, yeah, you really told them. <laughs> <laughs> That's a your heart too. I'm not smug. They are smug. That's pretty smug. <laughs> I'm serious. I'm, guys, I really mean this. This is real. This is actually, if I can say one thing that is really powerful. By the way, okay, now I now alienate 90% of my students. Right? The politics of the Upper West Side. We detest the Christian right. Why? Because we know the truth to every question. And they're wrong about all of them. <laughs> right? We detest their self-righteousness. Really? Have you ever been to a Shabbos meeting with my friends? I'm serious. Right? This is like really hard stuff. The temptation to smugness is about as resilient a temptation as one could possibly have. It's really hard. Okay. Now there's 97 hands as we run out of time. Let's start on this side. Um, yeah. Uh, does Rav Dessler work within a framework of mitzvot uh, being in, a, in some sort of a hierarchy? Um, I don't think I really know how to answer that question well. Do you mean are mitzvot ben adam l'chavero more important than mitzvot ben adam l'makom? Okay. I, no, I, is that I, what you mean? Yeah, I, I guess the, the purpose of the question is because I'm curious if... <coughs> if um, the half dollar reyach hakamocha is worth more, according to Rav Dessler, than shaking a lulo. Let's just say. And if yes, then why didn't? Then and if yes, then the whole conversation of um, the mitzvah is to act in a way that will get you to feel that way. Then why didn't the Torah just say so? Well, you know, I don't really know the answer to your question. Um, But I have a feeling what he would say, which is not really an answer to your question, but I have a feeling what he would want to say in response to that question is (coughs) that if you are engaged in mitzvot bin adam la makom and deprioritizing mitzvot bin adam la chavero, it is not the makom who you're worshiping. And therefore, on some level, you're not doing the mitzvot. It's not that they're, it's not that they're necessarily one is more important than the other. It's that the reality of your Bein Adam L'chavero life reveals something very fundamental, maybe the most fundamental truth of the state of your Bein Adam L'chavero life, too. 
That's not really a direct answer to your question, but I think it's what he'd be more interested in actually answering, right? What he'd be more interested in answering is sort of saying, no, but what am I really trying to do here? Now, I think most of your people in general would say, and, and a variety of people in Musar do say versions of this, right? Look, if all you do is the mitzvot, and you're not, that, by, by the mitzvot, I'm talking about like, you know, shaking a lulav, and you're not actively engaged in the process of working on yourself, you're not from, you're just like, mitzvot anashim malumada, you're just doing rote stuff. You're not even, I don't know where this is, you're not in the parsha at that point. You're just like, you're, not, you're, really like, you're not even in the conversation. Right? You're not. You're just not there. And that's, by the way, that's a very biting indictment, right, of, you know what's interesting about this, which is very tragic, right? <laughs> we all like to think, right, our time is in worse shape than anybody else. Sometimes like that, too, is a form of smugness, right? You know, everybody else had a hard time, but in late modernity and industrial capitalism, oh, my God, right? <laughs> and yet you open Chavot Halavavot, right? You know, one of the most important pietistic texts in Jewish, in Jewish life. It basically says, you know what the problem is? People are writing hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of books about the details of halacha, and no one has ever sat down to write a book about what kind of person am I supposed to be. It's amazing. No one's ever written that book. So I'm going to write that book because, I mean, we all know, and there's a kind of passive aggression here, right? We all know that that's the heart of what the Torah is. We all know that. So, clearly it's some kind of weird oversight that I can't explain. So I'm going to actually lay out what it really means to be from. Well, right, I mean, we all know, right, is a rather cutting way of describing, forget about the regular Jews. What about all the rabbis who are writing about the wrong things? So there's something like very... I don't even know what I am. What, what question was I even responding to when I started saying that? There's something very, very kind of powerful about this, and um, it says to us, right? I think you have this also in, in a variety of Kabbalistic ethical texts, right? That like the mitzvot are simply less important on some level than engaging in the project of working on yourself. That does not mean that the mitzvot are unimportant. Everyone will rush in to make that point, right? But it does mean, right, that if you're... Look, I mean, this is hard. Should I really say this? Every religion, and I, it, it, it saddens me to say this, that on this level, Judaism is no exception, has Yetzir Haras. And one of Judaism's Yetzir Haras is, okay, so I keep the Shulchan Aruch. And especially in Mitzvot Ben Adam Lamakom, I'm very medaktik about, you know, the shear of wine on Erev Pesach. Very medactic about that. I'm less medactic about the dignity of the person who does my laundry. I'm less medactic on that. And like, that's like one of our Yitzhar Haaretz. First of all, the prioritization of Ben Adam and Makom. And second of all, the obsession with halacha to the exclusion of, which is the opposite of what halacha is like you're supposed to be, who are you in the world? That, I suspect, is worse now than it has ever been. And I think it's interesting sociologically to think about why that happens. That's a real illness. Right? That's one of the ways in which in a large, right, there's real illness in that. Right? It's all about, right? It's all about, it's all about halacha. It's not about. I mean, I remember, I'm sorry, you know, here I'm, I'm going to therapy for a hundred years. But I remember, I remember a teacher of mine sitting down as I was leaving yeshiva and saying to me, look, you know what? In the end, when you go to college, only one thing I want you to remember. Shafts and Postkin. Right? Talmud and the law codes. And then respond to And I wanted to say even then, what about me dope? What if I talk to people? Well, why would you say that? It's not that I think you're wrong. It's that you're giving me a truncated picture of what it means to be from. On your own terms. Now, everyone has versions of this, right? Which is, you can be liberal and say, okay, it's all about certain lofty ideas, which very quickly become platitudes if they're not concretized in the world. Right? That's the danger of sort of the rebellion against a certain form of traditionalism, right? Just to say, okay, right, what is it? You know, I know you keep Shabbos, but I love everyone. Okay. 
that's nice. Last week it was smug. But, but also, like, but also, it's a way of, it, it's, it's like a way of, and by the way, I hear lines like that all the time, right? They, they just care about Shulchan Aruch, but we, we're committed to, like, the really important things, okay? And a lot of times those descend into mere platitudes. So, I don't know, I, thank you for bearing with me. Work for me. I want to take two last comments because we're over time, and then I know that a lot of people want to say things, I'll stick around and... Please? Yeah. Well, I basically agree with everything you're saying about... I'm not even sure I agree with everything you're saying, so I find that disturbing, but yeah. Well, what you just said, I just have a big problem with what you said before, what you said when you filled in the details, which is that religion is one thing, and working on ourselves is another thing, or a lock is one thing, and working on ourselves is a separate thing. And I, I, I think... I, I don't think that. No, I, no, I'm sorry. I was trying to report how I think a lot of people set up the world. And, and by the way, a lot of the people who set up the world that way would not defend that if asked directly. But descriptively, that's what happens. Well, I, I agree with you, and I agree with that's the way it is in a large part of, the, of our world. However, a, a true religion or a true halakhic teaching would not do that by any means. A true halakhic teaching Jewishly, the whole point of it Look, is to bring the ethical and the spiritual and the religious together. Look, so, so I want to just say one thing. Maybe this is an interesting textual thing for people to think about, and maybe we'll close with this, and then I'll take your comment after because I want to, you know, liberate people. Um, <laughs> the Rambam is very clear by putting Hilchot Deot, one of the most difficult words to translate, Right? the laws of virtue, moral self-cultivation, at the, at the beginning of his law code, that that work is halacha. It's not halacha in the sense that it can be described as simply this is asur, this is mutar. It's a different genre of halachic discourse. But it's halacha, meaning it's obligatory, right? And by the way, if you think about the structure of Say for Hamadan, the Rambam, the Rambam also does something else that's extremely subtle. It's actually not that subtle, but somehow I think most of us miss it. Which is, have you ever noticed that Hilchot Shuva are not part of any halachot that relate to time of the year? Right? This is actually very interesting, right? The Rambam makes a conscious choice that Hilchot Shuva belongs in Sefer Hamada, in the part of the Mishnah Torah I think it's safe to say he thought was the basis on which everything else should be built. Right? Because Shuva, I'm going to say this in a ridiculous way. Shuva has nothing to do with Rosh Hashanah and Kippur. Shuva is about what it means to be alive and trying to live in a relationship with God and to be a certain kind of person. Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur are times that God has set aside for us to do a particular intensive version of that work. But these mitzvot are not dependent on that. Now, the way in which that's a response to you is to say, of course it's not right. I mean, there's two ways to imagine this. One is to say halacha is concrete norms, and agada, which is also obligatory, is everything else. The Rambam actually moves in a somewhat different direction from that, as does the Interim Rabbi Soloveitchik, which is to say, no, all of that kind of aspiration <coughs> to a certain mode of being, that is halacha. By the way, the Rambam paskin the Nilcho Deot about what I should eat and not eat for lunch. And you want to say, well, how is that halacha? Because actually taking care of myself and being responsible for who and how I am in the world is a chiyu, is obligatory. It's not like, oh, there's this other stuff that I do. So I'm not, I, I sort of want to be clear about that. Now, let me just end by saying, you know, I, I really, I open this text up in the hopes that we um, challenge ourselves to, even if there's, you know, places in this text that, we wonder whether they might be overstated or some of us might have misgivings about that idea or that idea. This text, I think, just lays before us a really powerful ethical and spiritual challenge. Along the way, it's just that those two things are, if you want to be serious about being religious, indistinguishable, right? And basically says, like, what's your aspiration? And, you know, we're a desktop here. I can imagine him saying, how often do you actually think about that question? How often do you ask yourself, like, what is your orientation? What are you oriented towards? And there's something I think about that that is, you know, again, you can, I just want to encourage us, let's not allow 
a misgiving about this articulation or that articulation to kind of escape the question that he asks us, which I think is very powerful. Even if you feel you need to nuance it in some way, the question he's asking is really, you know, basically like, what are your shi'ifot? What are your aspirations? What kind of person do I want to be? Um, and what kind of person do I want to be not? What kind of person do I want to evaluate the other people around me as being? Um, which I think is very important. And that gets her hard. I mean, I'm like an expert in that. Right? And it's, it's really very important to kind of wrestle with that question. No, this is about me. I'm not going to kind of turn the, the mirror, whatever, right? turn the light on someone else and say, oh, wow, Rodessler just 